This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Here with me is my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Daily News. The revival of Once Upon a Mattress opens tomorrow night on Broadway at the Broadhurst Theater, and we are delighted tonight to be joined by its composer, Mary Rogers. Mary, welcome to Theater Talk. How are you? Good to see you. Um, now, when this show opened in 1959, it made a star of Carol Burnett, and she was kind of uh, this gawky and ungainly but very charming personality. Sarah Jessica Parker, though, who stars in your production, is different kind of uh, performer, even physically, from Carol Burnett. Has that changed the show much? It has a little. She's definitely gainly. There's no question. <laughs> <laughs> she's a <laughs> big. She's adorable. Yeah. You know, she has a great little figure, and she moves wonderfully, and she's very sexy. And so that, that changes it because it becomes sort of more of a love story, a, mm -hmm. a real love story. Mm -hmm. But she's very quirky and, and eccentric and so marvelously peculiar. She's, she's just not very different from Carol. Yeah. She's not playing an ugly duckling. Absolutely not. I don't think there's any way to do that with her. She's really too <laughs> no. attractive. Well, she might put in the teeth or something. Yeah. Or anyway. uh, no, she's, but she's, she's genuinely funny, uh, just different. Yeah. Now, this is uh, based on the, uh, the Princess and the Pea yeah. story, correct? Yeah. Uh, and we, we would be remiss in not pointing out, though, that you are the uh, daughter of the great Broadway composer Richard Rogers. Um, did uh, he have a hand in this show or in any way? I mean, you were the daughter, you're writing a, a no. musical for one of the giants, uh, looking over your shoulder at all when this was coming together? No, uh, the first song that I wrote for the show when we realized that we were going to have it done at the Phoenix and George Abbott was gonna direct it, uh, I played for my father and he said, why did you do that in the bridge? And I said, <laughs> I don't know, I thought it sounded good. And he said, I wouldn't have done that. And I thought, I think this is the last time I'm going to do this. Because I would never know who was writing the music, and neither would anybody else. Right, right. So I explained to him that I thought it was a good idea from that point on for him to hear what I'd written when everybody else did. And I think he always understood it intellectually, and he never understood it emotionally. I think his feelings so were hurt. So you think really he hurt. resented it? His feelings were hurt. Really? Mm -hmm. Mary, your son is a composer. Yeah. Adam Gettle. Adam Gettle. Gettle. Right. Uh, um, is there support that you gave him that your father didn't give you? Probably because his, his talent was was evidencing itself so much earlier. I mean, I was this sloppy, unwilling pianist at a point when he his voice had changed, but he'd been a boy soprano soloist with the Met and City Opera and Santa Fe, and he was this clearly a musician Adam when he was a little boy. Right. Yeah, and uh, by the time his voice changed, he was then. Uh, still playing the piano but but taking up the acoustic bass and mm -hmm. by the time he was 16 he was writing and for about a year I would say why did you do that I wouldn't have done that and a year later he was so far beyond me in terms of what he knew and what he was attempting to do and what he was accomplishing that I thought it was time to shut up and mind my own business and <laughs> let him go his yeah, own way. Yeah, we should say he wrote Floyd Collins uh, Floyd last Collins. year, which was quite a remarkable. Just, piece. just going back to your to your father, um, what did he think of the show when he finally saw it? I mean, did and was the first time he saw it opening night? Yes, and he loved it. He was. He then decided to take over my career. He said, "Now you don't need an agent. Uh, just have a lawyer, Daddy. You don't need an agent. All you need is a lawyer. I need an agent." But he then got got very prideful about the whole thing and, and wanted to know exactly what I was doing all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a it was a big hit show back then, and and and, and remains a kind of perennial in um, uh, summer stock and high school. Yeah, theaters. more high schools I think than stock, but it has nine principal parts, which mm -hmm. happened because we were forced to write for the people who were higher than the base salary at Tamarind in the Poconos when they originally wrote it. The producer said, if you don't give these people things to do, you can't do the musical. So we had to create parts for nine principals, mm -hmm. which is what high schools love. That means 18 parents get to see their children <laughs> in every or, or now, this day and age. Is it fair to say the royalties from uh, Once Upon a Mattress are greater than those from Oklahoma? No, but you know it's seventh. It's about seventh in the list really? of, 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 of Rodgers and Hammerstein of stock and amateur productions. Extraordinary. After ah. Oklahoma and South Pacific and Sound of Music and right. those other terrible things. <laughs> those minor shows that yeah, nobody's right. ever heard of before. Um, how come you didn't uh, do, do more Broadway shows after Once Upon a Mattress? 
I got involved in a lot of other things, like reading. I had five <laughs> children. Um, and then children's books. Uh, you know, Freaky, Freaky Friday, Friday, which you wrote, and, yeah. And two sequels after that. And uh, I dabbled in screenplay writing until I got sick of that because you had no control over mm. what you write there. And as an autonomous New York writer, we're all spoiled. Um, and it, I think by the time the, uh, the Elvis Presley and, or whoever, even the Beatles, had, had arrived on the scene, I think I probably thought I, I didn't have very much to, to offer. I did write other things. I did The Mad Show, and, mm -hmm. and I did that wonderful flop, <laughs> Hot Spot with Judy Holliday in 1963. <laughs> and I went on writing children's things because I love doing that. Yeah. But um, then I got into writing this McCall's column with my mother. Mm -hmm. It was the only time we ever got along was when we were working <laughs> together, which was interesting. And, you are uh, the most candid person I ever get to interview. Oh, yeah, I always tell the truth. What's the difference? <laughs> You're right. Did you have the kind of dis I mean, your father was, it seems to me, an incredibly disciplined man. I think I remember reading Get Up Every Morning Early and be writing songs. No, he wasn't disciplined. Wasn't he got disciplined. up every morning because he loved writing music. Right. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, and I suppose as he got older, he got up every morning the way we all do as we get older because we can't seem to sleep any longer. <laughs> but, there. but he did, he wrote very quickly and he wrote early. Mm -hmm. And then I don't think he knew what he was doing with himself for the rest of the day because it wasn't any fun. If he mm -hmm. wasn't either writing or playing theater, you know, b being at, at, in New Haven or wherever. Did you bring the kind of drive, though, to um, uh, writing a show that your father, that your father did when he was doing all the great hits? I mean, we, you know, was it in your blood, the fire in your belly? I think it's there, I think it's probably was there when I was working on something, but it wasn't there a lot of the other times. And I think that, quite frankly, it has to do with talent, because I think talent is about 35% of the, the uh, equation, and determination and fire is 65%, but they're not unlinked. <laughs> uh, in other words, I don't think Steve Sondheim would be persuaded that it would be interesting to write movies or have five children or <laughs> any one of those other things, and I don't think my father wanted to write movies or have five children. He wanted to do theater. That was all he wanted to do. And I don't know whether it's because I'm a woman and that makes a difference. I loved having many strings to my bow. When I get back to writing music, I think, how could I have ever not done this all my life? It's the most fun in the world. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's like a water-sealed compartment, and when I'm not doing it, it's as though it doesn't exist. Well, right. when you bring up the children alone, I would think it would be impossible to raise five children and then to take your focus and be a composer. Well, it's easier when you, when you have help, and I, and yes. I did. Yeah. And of course, the, the younger two, I, I had a very nice husband to whom I'm still married, Hank right. Gettle, to help me with all of that. But, uh, it is it is hard to, to to keep your focus. And when I was writing books, I would have to leave everybody in the care of whoever and and go away mm -hmm. for three weeks and work around the clock. Have you written new material for uh, this for this production? There's one very sweet little new song in there that that uh, Dauntless sings to to uh, Winifred. Mm -hmm. were, but, were were you out of the um, uh, the um, uh, well, what's the word? Uh, I mean, not having ri had you written composing much music? Mode. Yes, or have you, were you out of yeah. the composing mode when this show came along? Did you have to get it, was no, difficult it to go back to, to come the back pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I also had this year that Rainbow and Stars show, which right. was sort of a compilation mm -hmm. of stuff, right. and I wrote some new things for that. And mm -hmm. when I first get back to writing, I think, gee, I wonder if I can even find Middle C. But it <laughs> seems to come come back fairly quickly. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about your 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 father. Could you? Um, Tell us uh, his, his work habits. Uh, how long did it take him to, to write a song? Uh, you said before he wasn't very disciplined, but I mean, the guy well, wrote some of the greatest songs ever written. So but, what was the magic? What was the trick? Uh, well, when I say he wasn't disciplined, discipline wasn't necessary. It was what he loved to do more than anything in the world. Mm -hmm. Writing lyrics takes discipline. That's hell. Mm. It really is. I mean, he knows that he knew how to write lyrics. I know how to write lyrics. I feel sorry for anybody who does that. It's <laughs> like having rats running around in your head. But uh, he adored doing what he did. So it wasn't a question of discipline. The only time discipline would enter the picture would be making manuscripts. In those days, they didn't have wonderful things like finale. And he used to moan about the fact that there wasn't a, a musical typewriter. Mm -hmm. He was so bored sitting at that piano and playing a couple of bars, and then he'd lean over and 
write on, you know, on a card table, in a manuscript paper and stuff. Wow. And did he just hear this incredible stream of gorgeous melodies racing through his head all the time? I mean, no, I think he only heard it when he when he had a lyric presented to him. Oh, really? I mean, he had when to he write was from working the with Larry first. Hart. That was different because the music came first. Because Larry, you know, had a bit of a problem, and the only way to get a lyric out of him was to lock him in a room and keep playing him something attractive <laughs> until he came up with a lyric. Yeah, I mean, your, must have, but, your father must have had to exert some discipline there because Mr. Hart was supposedly pretty scattered. He was an alcoholic. Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah. He was an alcoholic. Uh, he was also one of the most adorable people right. I've ever known in my so. life, and the loveliest. He was. He was just the sweetest man in the world. But it was, you know, problematic working with him as he got older, and the problem became more intense. Mm -hmm. Oscar worked for weeks on a lyric, but don't forget when when that there are all these wonderful myths about how my father would sit down and write Bali High and the length of time it took him to play it. In <laughs> fact, right. he knew what that moment was going to be because he and Oscar had discussed the scene. They knew who was going to sing the song. They mm -hmm. probably knew the rhythm it was going to be in. They knew the mood and. When he got that lyric, it was probably germinating in, in the musical brain cells for all, for all those three weeks that Oscar was working on it. Then, when all he needed is a piece of paper, and of course it sounds then as though he was writing it more, much more quickly than he actually was. There's all that downtime that doesn't show. Any um, <coughs> advice did he give you about uh, sort of making a life for yourself in the theater? Any tricks of the trade? Watch your back no. or something like that? No, <laughs> no. he used That'll to give you. advice to my friends who wanted to be in the theater and say, learn how to type and do shorthand, because when you want to get a job for a producer, that's the first thing they'll ask you, even if you never need to use it. So <laughs> learn how to do it. Practical um, man. I don't, he didn't give me any advice because I don't think he thought any more than I did that that's what I was going to be doing. Mm. Uh, it was more like, can't you straighten up and clean up your room and comb your hair and, you know, behave yourself? And um, in a book that, uh, a book of your father's memoirs that was uh, yeah. re-released, re yeah. yeah, Musical Stages, a couple of years ago, you uh, had a very interesting, interesting introduction in the, in, in the book, which you talked mm -hmm. about your father's um, uh, mood swings and some mm -hmm. of his depression, things I did not know about your yeah. father. How severe were, was his... Uh, the depressive state or his psychological problem? I think they were probably pretty rough, but with a lot of people uh, who are, you know, who suffer from dysthymia, which is a mild form of, of depression, or a more severe form, the, so much energy goes into pretending that that's not a problem, that, that it was hard to detect. Mm. Uh, I, I just knew that, that he he often seemed unhappy, and as, and as he got older, he was definitely unhappy. I mean, once Oscar died, <coughs> we couldn't really find somebody to work with who was, we've talked about this before in a <laughs> previous show, but it's, it's hard to be another generation and find somebody right. to work with, and that was all he loved to do in the world. Well, you know, when he was doing um, uh, Do I Hear a Waltz with uh, Steve yeah. Sondheim and Arthur Lawrence, I think his nickname was God. Godzilla. Yes. Now you were in an interesting <laughs> position because I think two of your closest friends in the world are Steve Sondheim and Arthur Lawrence and were at the time. <clears throat> How yes. did you negotiate those troubled waters? Uh, with flippers on, <laughs> carefully. <laughs> uh, I would get phone calls every morning at 9 o'clock from everybody so complaining about everybody else. But it, it, was, uh, it was sad because I think it, it could have been a wonderful musical. It had some lovely songs in it. It did. It did. I think it was badly cast, among other things. Mm -hmm. they, they picked a girl, Elizabeth Allen, who was the most unvulnerable girl you've ever seen in your life. She was perfectly wonderful looking. Mm -hmm. And she didn't look as though she'd ever had a problem. And this was not the time of the cuckoo lady in, in Venice. Right. right. Who, uh, who picked her, do you think? I think they probably all did. All together. Uh, although it may have been more my father because she sang well. Uh, mm -hmm. yes. What was the trouble uh, with that crowd? I mean, it is a kind of famous Broadway story, do I hear? Well, it just seemed like the giants of Broadway, yeah. these great talents, got together and didn't get along. What well, was like the root of I it? Think, I think part of it was generational. Mm -hmm. It's just a different generation. And my father didn't have his buddies around with him, his, his sort of um, kind of ogle the, the chorus girls and go out <laughs> and have a fun lunch at, at Casey's or whatever. I mean, these guys were really Steve quite. Stephen Arthur different. weren't ogling the chorus girls. No, they weren't, <laughs> and they didn't want to play, you know, play theater with my father. I think he was lonely, yeah. and probably resentful, 
and I think Steve underneath had every right to be resentful and perhaps was because he wanted to write the music himself. Mm -hmm. And he was talked into accepting my father, whom he admired enormously, mm -hmm. uh, because it was the commercial sensible thing to do. And I think Arthur persuaded him that, that he should give up his own composing ambitions for this and to do it. Mm -hmm. But that's hard to take. As a matter of fact, he wrote a perfectly lovely Do I Hear a Waltz song of his own that I've now forgotten, but it was just beautiful. It was before he realized that he wasn't going to be able to do the music. So I think there were a lot of psychological underpinnings that were there. I think probably my father also resented my intense devotion to Arthur and Steve. Mm. It was, you know, I think if there were ever any problems, he probably expected that my loyalty should automatically be with him. And, I was and it was just, not? Well, it was, I was just bloody minded enough to, to put it wherever I thought it needed to be at the time, depending <laughs> on what horrid circumstance next raised its head. <laughs> now, as, as the Broadway world changed uh, and as the, as the shows and the kind of music on Broadway changed, did your father get bitter at all about? No. I don't think he did. He was very generous about other people's writing, the, the way all really good, talented people are, because they know that there's only one of them, and there's plenty of room in the world for more. For instance, he was a huge fan of Frank Lester's, and should have been, sure. and of course, Gershwin and, and Jerry Kearney adored, and I think his early songs were, were sort of more from Kern. I think he probably felt the way a lot of people did, even including Julie Stein, or uh, uh, like, what do we do with ourselves now when that new sound came in? Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think it was confusing and scary, but not embittering. Right. Let me bring it back to Once Upon a Mattress, mm -hmm. um, because uh, uh, it is an old-fashioned show, um, mm -hmm. and we are in the age of rent, <laughs> God right. knows. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, Chicago opened uh, last month to great acclaim. Do you have any trepidation of, uh, of going up against uh, the juggernaut that Chicago? No, I love Chicago. I, I'm crazy about it. In fact, I, uh, as I told you before, I, I went up to Judith Dakin at Encores when I saw it there and said, you've got to do something with this. It's absolutely great. And they landed up in the theater we wanted. Which was a Richard Rogers. I thought I'd just take out Richard and put in Mary. Mary. <laughs> uh, no, it's a wonderful show, but, but you any wouldn't want to see three shows like Chicago. Right. Uh, or, I mean, they're, they're all different. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. The thing about, about Mattress that I think works very well and will work is that it's the only show I can think of, frankly, where parents can take their kids and have as much fun as the kids are having. You don't think Rent is a children's show? <laughs> <laughs> Depending on Prostitution, your Depending on your child. Right. Bohemia. <laughs> but so often I think parents are, are, you know, are desperate to find things to take their kids, so they go to Beauty and the Beast, which is which is swell, but it's basically but kids' capage. entertainment, and they're doing it for their children. Right. But, but it works on two levels, and, and kids have a wonderful time because they know the story. And they, they love the idea of a, of a princess who's kind of goony and jumps on the furniture. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are those other more subtle values that, that the grown-ups get. Well, and uh, uh, we have a minute left, but uh, should the show take off and, and, and become the next big uh, Broadway hit, uh, will you be spending more time at the piano, spending more time writing Broadway shows? I don't think so. No? I think the, the time has passed now. I've got my, my husband and I have our wonderful son, Adam, who's taking over. Also, I'm chairman of the board of Juilliard, which is work I love very much. And you don't just say to a gang like that, listen, I think I'll take six months <laughs> off and fend for yourselves while I write a musical. Sure. I think I'm just moving on to another phase of my life. Yeah. Mary Rogers, thank you very much. You've been a delightful guest, and we wish you all the luck with Once Upon a Mattress, which opens tomorrow night at the Broadhurst Theater. Thank you. Michael, what's happening with Victor Victoria? Well, you may have seen a rather perceptive and insightful story I wrote for the Daily News about uh, Julie Andrews' frequent absences from Victor Victoria. Uh, by my count, she's missed about 75 performances out of 424 over the last year since Victor Victoria's opened on Broadway. Uh, that's about, uh, you, in other words, you have about a 20% chance of getting Julie Andrews' understudy if you go to see the show. It's rather extraordinary. Uh, and it has wreaked havoc with the show's finances. Now, Victor Victoria is capitalized at $8.5 million. Uh, when Julie Andrews is out for a week, as she has been for several weeks, the show loses about half a million dollars. When she's out just 
for a performance, they lose thirty to forty thousand dollars because ticket goers can get refunds. So <clears throat> the story that I wrote was that um, uh, Julie, this show is having trouble paying back because of Julie Andrews' absences. And I also raised the question uh, delicately, I thought, but I think it needs to be addressed that Julie Andrews may just frankly be a little too old to be carrying a big show like Victor Victoria on her back eight performances a week. And uh, I know there, there was some... Uh, uh, no, I think, I think the point is that Julie mm -hmm. Andrews is an irreplaceable star. And so if there are people who want to see Julie Andrews so much that if she can crawl out on that stage, particularly in, with her legs showing in those costumes, they want to see her. And yeah, they're but, grateful yeah. for that 80% chance. Yeah, but the problem that is that, can. you know, 20% of the time she can't crawl out of, on stage, she can't crawl out of bed, let alone crawl out yes, on stage. Know, she's had pneumonia, she's had indeed, pesky bronchial infection, she's had gallbladder surgery, and, you know, they're asking a lot of a 61-year-old woman, albeit a big star tonight, kind to carry a show as badly reviewed as Victor Victoria no, on her back night But isn't night. it fabulous that that 61-year-old great star, I mean, you're one of the greatest stars of the musical theater still working, is willing <laughs> to subject herself to such torture. Yeah, well tell to the tell, tell, sure, there. tell the investors who are going to lose lose their 8.5 million dollars how fabulous it is that their star can't get there more than 80% of the time. Well, that's it is a, a real problem for isn't this Isn't that show. the insurance company's uh, Well, uh, there domain? is uh, there is some haggling going on between the producers of Victor Victoria and Lloyd's of London, the insurance company, mm -hmm. to see if they can get some recovery for the uh, performances she's missed. But you know, as one of the producers said to me, that's sort of like saying the check is in the mail. Nobody knows when they'll get the kind of money, and even when they get the money, they won't get all of the money that the show lost because of Julie Andrews absences. Now we should point out that Julie Andrews is going on vacation in January for a month right. when Liza Minnelli takes over. Fantastic choice. Uh, yeah, except interestingly enough though, Liza Minnelli also has a track record of missing lots of performances on well, Broadway. That she was dumped in a lot in the, when she was on the rink, she missed a lot of performances. That was long when she did ago, the act, she missed some too. So long maybe ago she's, and far away. <laughs> maybe she's a little better. I'm sure she is. Interesting to me though is that uh, Liza Minnelli, who is a big name, is is selling only so so at the box office. This has nothing I think to do with with Liza Minnelli, as, as so much as it has to do with the fact that people hesitate to buy tickets in January when the weather might be bad. And you remember last year we had terrible snowstorms, which uh, hurt a lot of business on Broadway. So I think people are a little reluctant at this point to, to buy tickets. But I that wager far that advance. on a night by night basis, when she's on, it'll be a sellout. Right. I th when it yeah, does the, 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 snow, the producers buy the think tickets. that she'll be a sellout. Now, you know, the other rumor on Broadway is that Julie Andrews is not going to return once she leaves the show. She's really just. Yeah, not but don't well you think because her money's in this show? Don't you think she'll come back? I, I think she will. I think it? she will come back. They're advertising that she's going to come back. She and her husband, the director Blake Edwards, mm -hmm. are significant uh, stakeholders in this show. And also, I, while I don't believe Victor Victoria is ever going to pay back its 8.5 million dollars on Broadway, you have to remember that Julie Andrews earns 50 thousand dollars a week doing that show, even when she's out of it. And her husband Blake Edwards gets royalties from directing it, so they could cover the losses that they'll probably have on the investment in the show with the amount of money they generate each week exactly. in salary. So exactly. there's incentive for her, for her to come back. I don't believe she'll be there past May. I know the producers will hope to recast the show with another star so it can run through the summer and indefinitely so but they can make their money back. There? But I don't think they can do it. I don't think there's anyone. I mean, anyone. this is basically the Julie Andrews this show and that's This is the Julie it. Andrews show and, and, and Julie Andrews fans the world over are so glad she's there to do it. <laughs> and, and you, know, you are and the president of the fan club. Well, I no, I'm not, but you know. She's Just remember, not she's not too, there all the time. She's not there all the time, but 75 she's, performances she's out of 424, that's too a lot. Old. So, well, Susan, I think that your argument is undercut by the facts. She's sick all the time. Well, she's tired all the time. Uh, you know, think, you think Sarah, sprightly 22 year old Sarah Jessica Parker is missing? It's twenty percent of her performances. No. Well, I don't want to make any comments on sprightly twenty-two-year-old Sarah Jessica Parker, <laughs> but I'll tell you, it's uh, Victor Victoria is a show about unconditional love, and people unconditionally love Julie Andrews and the old bones, and they don't, and they want to see this old diva up there. Or the problem is that they don't, they, they don't always get to see her up there because well, she misses when they so many. All right. So anyway, but, on but she does give a good good performance, and she has a fine talent. She's a great talent. Does right, that yes. satisfy your Julie Andrews? Yes. Cheering. <laughs> yes, and I hope it satisfies the Julie Andrews cheerers out there. So now, Ragtime. Ah, uh, yes, Ragtime is an $8.5 million musical that is being produced by Garth Drabinsky, the Canadian impresario who did Showboat and Kiss of the Spider Woman mm -hmm. on Broadway. Mm -hmm. It opened up in Toronto, where Drabinsky has his headquarters uh, this past two weeks ago. And interestingly enough, Drabinsky invited all the New York's top drama critics up to see it. Ben Brantley from The Times went up, and Clive Barnes at The Post went up, Linda Weiner from Newsday went up, Mike Kushwar from the AP. Uh, and the reviews came out, and they were uh, they were very mixed. Um, uh, mm. Most of the critics liked the score, uh, score by uh, um, Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty, mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. wrote Once on This Island. Uh, and they thought Terrence McNally did a pretty good job adapting the E.L. Doctor novel. But they all complained that the show goes to seed, to pot, in the second act. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think it was Linda Weiner who said this show seems to have no clue as to where it's going, other mm -hmm. than Broadway uh, later in the <laughs> year. Uh, I found what I find interesting about this though is. 
in the old days, producers, when they took shows out of town, they did it so that they, the critics wouldn't be around, so they could get the show, so what see legs, suppose? get it up and running. So, you know, why would Drabinsky invite all New York's drama so critics? Have the buzz of the show now is that it's mixed, it needs a lot of work. Uh, I don't think it's going to help group sales, which are crucial to building in advance for a show, if the show got negative reviews in New York. I think, though, if I can sort of um, read Garth's mad mind, I think his feeling is that if the critics point him in the right direction, and if he follows their advice, oh. then when he brings it to New York, and the critics see, you know, because critics are a bunch of egomaniacs, that aha, you oh, get my they advice, <laughs> they'll, give it, they'll give it a rave review. So I think there's a, a rather shrewdness on the part of Garth Drabinsky there, and, and he may be able to pull it off. I do know that they will follow uh, some of the advice of the critics. They are really going to try to retool that second act, which is causing them a lot of problems. Did Showboat ever pay back? That's a big mystery. You know, Showboat was a $10 million production on Broadway. Produced by Gar Garth. Right. Garth yeah. Rabinsky made a big announcement a year ago that it paid back within a year, but nobody believed him uh -huh. because the show cost $600,000 a week to run. Uh -huh. And while it often grossed $700,000 to $750,000, there were other weeks where it dipped below that, that, that weekly nut. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's very difficult to tell. I don't think anyone will ever know. Uh, Garth Rabinsky is, his is a public company, and he can shift a lot of the bills uh, into other areas of the company. Ah, these are the mysteries. So it's, All a, right. it's a tangled web, that ah, tangled. Uh, Garth right. Rabinsky empire. Okay, Michael. See you next time on Theater Talk. Good night. Thank you.